Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Happy Wednesday. It's so wonderful to see you all. We're just going to give folks a second to kind of come in from the waiting room. While we're waiting to kind of get started, if you'd like, feel free to, uh, to use the chat. Tell us where you all are from. I would love to know a little bit who's out there. It's always kind of nice to see all the faces, or rather, we can't see all faces. But um, anyway, we're going to get started here because I want to make sure that you all have the time that you need. Ooh, Green Bay. I, go Packers. Um, my name is Nicole Pilar, and I am a CollegeWise counselor with CollegeWise. We are so excited to be here with Zello to talk with all of you about how to help support your students to write more effective college essays. Uh, a few kind of quick uh, just housekeeping things. Uh, if you wouldn't mind using the Q&A, so at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see the chat, which is just for like, you know, telling us where you all are from. Uh, but if you have specific questions that you would like Kevin to answer, we left some time at the end, please use the Q&A feature. Uh, you can upvote the things that you'd like. Uh, also, we will be sending the recording of this presentation. So if there's anything that pops up, somebody comes into your office, has a question, no worries, you'll get a recording of this at the end of this week. And also some resources that we've put together, which I'm very excited about. Uh, and of course, our last uh, kind of, of this three-part professional development series is going to be on October 6th at uh, 3 p.m. Eastern time. It's gonna be about all the changes to the Common App and how counselors can help support their students to put forth the best common applications that they possibly can uh, using the different spaces given all the things that have been happening. So with that being said, Kevin, would you mind doing the next slide? Yeah, so absolutely. All right, you're up, my Thanks, friend. Nicole. My show now? Okay, yeah, so great. You, you've done a quick introduction here, um, and I like to keep my portion of introductions mercifully brief when I can, um, because I feel like once somebody has shown up to hear you speak, they've, they've ostensibly enrolled in this process, right? So we can just sort of get going. Um, but in September of 1999, I decided that after working with a lot of students and, and learning a lot about college admissions that I wanted to start uh, my own little college counseling business. And so... Uh, I started working essentially like a tutor, and I called my little business CollegeWise. And in 1999, there were you know, the, the internet was not new, but online applications were new. So I quite literally uh, spent the fall sitting at students' kitchen tables and helping them fill out old-fashioned paper college applications. And um, over time, I hired more and more people to join me, many of whom came from offices of admission. And so today... Um, CollegeWise is the nation's largest college counseling company. So families hire us to help their kids get into college and we assign them to a college counselor. And we have the luxury of only having to worry about one thing, college admissions, which is why our job is so much easier than the job of school counselors. Uh, but we let, you know, we'll pair them with a counselor who sort of watches over them uh, and helps them through the process. A few years ago, we partnered with uh, Michelle Obama's organization, Reach Hired, uh, and we were in a long-term contract with them to share resources and advice and to do webinars with them to help reach under-resourced kids. Um, from the day that we signed that deal, I made uh, I made this my new screen screensaver, which I don't get animation when we're doing this online, but uh, that is Michelle Obama doing her victory dance at the DNC. And we've really enjoyed that uh, that partnership with them. I should also um, tell you too that I, I'm a parent. Um, so as we deal with uh, parents during the admissions process, uh, I have uh, I, I'm a parent of two young kids. So I, I have newfound um, sympathy for parents going through the process. Uh, my four-year-old last week announced that he wanted to pour his own cereal in the morning, and this is how that went. So um, hopefully I'm able to, to get better results with you guys talking about college essays than I was talking with my kid about uh, pouring cereal. Um, but I got good advice one time from my mother about how to do professional development for high school uh, employees, uh, teachers and counselors. My mother was a, a English teacher for 30 years at a public high school at my high school. Um, I never had her as my teacher, but my younger brother did, and he wrote his college essay about it, and he ended up going to Harvard. So it must have been worth something for that experience. But uh, you know, my, when I when I first started college wise, a high school principal saw me do a presentation at a local community organization, and she said, "Hey, I would love for you to come and do um, a, a, a professional development seminar for my faculty." And I was ready to do that, but I called my mom. I said, "Hey, I, you know, I've never actually done something for educators." And I want to make sure that I don't show up, um, you know, and, and kind of step in anything with them because I don't really have a sense of their work yet. And my mom said, well, here's the most important thing you need to know. Don't show up thinking that you know more than they do because you don't. 
And I said, well, thanks, mom. I thought you were going to build me up and give me some more confidence that I could feel when I talk with these people. But the truth is, I don't know your students. I don't know your communities. I don't know the unique challenges that you have with your kids. And there's no part of me that is under the illusion that I'm going to help you do your job better and make your experience better for your kids. What I feel like I can do is share some things that we have learned at CollegeWise by, we've worked with 25,000 students and about 70% of our counselors on staff worked in admissions offices before they came here. So we've learned a lot about how college essays are actually used in the process. And my goal is to share what I know and what we have learned together. I mean, I know this because I've learned it from my colleagues, is to share what I know. And I also want to share the four tips that we have put together for students that we believe help them write better college essays, whether or not they are going to be working closely with someone like us to help them brainstorm uh, th those, those various topics. And I wanna just share it all with you and then invite you to take whatever parts you believe might be helpful for your kids and bring them back and use them in any way that you want to. So I don't wanna prescribe a specific solution for you, but my hope is that if you can leave today, I mean, your time is valuable. And if you can leave today saying, I've picked up some new pieces of information, maybe some new anecdotes and a couple of tips I can share with my students that I think will really help them put better college applications together and help me do an even better job of trying to support them along the way. If I can get to that outcome, then I'll feel like, like this went pretty well. So that's my goal. And the four tips that we share, we originally came up with for our own use because we found that when students would come to meet with a college-wise counselor, they would often show up with ideas about what they wanted to write their own essays about, which is great because we're not writing them for them and we can't come up with the ideas for the students. It has to be their essays. But a lot of times when they would come in preliminarily excited about an essay that we knew might be problematic because they were gonna be writing something that would be perfectly fine, but something that a lot of students would write. For example, um, playing sports taught me the importance of committing to my goals. There's nothing wrong with that topic. And in fact, for many students, that's a true statement, but it's also a very, very common topic for athletes to write. And if the goal is to help this student stand out and help this college admissions officer appreciate the unique individual that goes beyond this application, that's an essay that's not gonna get the job done. We found it was difficult to engage with a student who came in excited about something when we felt like now we have to talk them out of that excitement. That's not the effect we wanna have on kids. So what we decided was let's actually bring them all in for a college essay seminar first. And we'll share the four tips to writing great essays. And then we found they came in still with their own ideas but they were inherently much stronger ideas. And then when high schools would invite us to come share, uh, you know, do a college essay seminar, to talk to their, to their uh, students or to talk with their teachers, we could share these four tips. And we felt that any student that followed these four tips, anybody from an A student to a C student can follow them. And we felt like they would be able to take that advice and actually make something really useful with it without us sitting next to them. So I wanna share those four tips with you and you can decide if and how you would best like to share them with your kids. So let's jump in and I'll give you the background for how we learned each of these and, and like how we, we use them with students. So of the four, if I could share one piece of advice with any student applying to college who's writing essays, and this is true whether they're writing a per statement, a short answer question, whether it's something that's a general question or something very specific, like how, why do you want to attend this college? These rules apply for any essay. And this would be the most important one I would share. Don't try to impress the admissions officers, just be honest. Now, of course, this advice that I'm sharing is the way that we share it with students. So I know that as school counselors, most, if not all of you will hear these and say, oh yeah, I understand that. I know that about college essays. So I'm not really teaching you, but I wanna teach you how we describe this to kids. And then maybe that would be useful for you. So naturally students have been trained to try to impress college admissions offices. That's what, I mean, all the stuff that they do in high school for better or for worse, a lot of it is with the goal of trying to get into college. I think there is both better and worse in there. Students that engage more in their academics and that you know take some uh, ownership of their, their college admissions process, that's a good thing to try to impress colleges. If it's you know students doing things that are against their own interests, 
um, things that make them unhappy, things that make them turn their attention away from things like family or personal and mental health, and then we're going to a bad place, but that's a whole nother, a whole nother webinar. Uh, don't try to impress admissions officers means that when a student sits down to write a college essay, it's a natural inclination to ask themselves, what does this college want to hear? And what is going to sound good? And it's not a bad inclination. I understand why they wonder that. The unfortunate part is that too many students arrive at exactly the same conclusions about what they should do, absent other advice. And oftentimes what that is, is I should pick something that I'm proud of in high school and then layer in how that demonstrates that I have traits that would be valuable for this college or um, that I've learned lessons from this experience that would be that would make me a more appealing college applicant. And again, that's not um, that's not erroneous thinking on that student's part. But they end up writing very similar college essays to everybody else, to, to many other students who are applying. And unfortunately, the other thing that happens to them in those situations is they start writing and expressing thoughts that actually aren't their own. They weren't actually thinking those things before. So a student might write something in a college essay, like when I reflect on my time playing for my high school basketball team, I feel very appreciative of the valuable lessons that I have learned that I can bring with me to college. That's a wonderful sentiment, but in 22 years of working with students, I've never ever heard a student express it that way. I've never heard them say that out loud. I doubt that any student has ever, any athlete has ever gone to their end of the year you know, meeting or their end of the year banquet, or even said to their team on the last game as the team's departing after the season. I doubt anybody has expressed a sentiment like that. You know, teammates, I personally feel uh, very fortunate to have participated in this experience with you because I believe, I mean, right, it just doesn't sound like something a teenager would say. And so what we're trying to get students to do here is not to just write, you know, frivolously and say whatever they want, but instead to actually tell the truth about these experiences without worrying whether or not they're going to be honest, uh, excuse me, without worrying about whether or not they're going to be impressive. And one of the, the colleagues who explained this to me the best um, is our chief academic officer, whose name is Arun, and you might have come to his previous webinar here about writing letters of recommendation. And he worked at the University of Chicago in admissions, then he went to Caltech, and he also read applications at UCLA. So by his estimation, he's read, I think it's 15,000 college, college applications and more than 30,000 essays. And he said, Students should think of the application and the essay as doing two separate but equally important roles in the, in the college admissions process. The application is where we as admissions officers size up whether or not the student is qualified of it to attend and capable of being successful here. That's where we look at what classes did they take in high school? What were their grades? Um, what, what test scores did they have on file if school if it's a school still using those? Um, what activities did they uh, did they participate in? What honors and awards did they win? What did their teachers and their counselors say about them in their letters of recommendation? What did the interviewer, if there was one, say about this student? That gives them enough information to get a sense of whether or not the student has worked hard enough and achieved to the point that college expects and could they be successful at that school? But the way Arun put it was, what I don't know without the essays is, do I like you? He said, when I would read the applications, I would ask, does this student to be, deserve to be admitted? But when I would read the essays, I would ask myself, would I want this student to be my roommate if I were back in college? And I thought that was a really effective way of phrasing it because you have these real human beings in high school filling out these standardized applications and you have these real human beings on the other side that care about more than just that student's grades, test scores, and activities. They care about this unique human being who's going to come presumably live in a dorm and interact with other students and participate on campus. And so they want, it's not about being popular. It's about being somebody they think like will make the experience even better for their fellow students and for the faculty that they interact with. And, you know, this is cliche advice, and we generally try to avoid cliches in college essays. Um, but just like, you know, our own mothers or grandmothers would have told us, if you want someone to like you, the best way to do that is to just what? Just be yourself. I actually, when I do this live in front of students, that's exactly how I phrase it. I say, 
you know, this might be a cliche and it might seem like advice you've heard over and over again, but if you want somebody to like you, the best way to do that is to just do what? And there will always be a group of students, sometimes all of them that will say, be yourself. They get there early. So I'll, I usually like to share some examples um, that I've just sort of committed to memory, not word for word, but the stories themselves, because I want students to get a sense of what we mean there. Um, I would encourage you to pick examples from, you know, your own students or what, you know, ones that you're familiar with and stories that you, you believe would resonate with your particular student communities. Um, but one example that I share is a student that we worked with whose opening line of her essay was, um, the worst part about being the slowest runner on my high school's cross country team is that occasionally I fall so far behind during a race that I have to ask for directions. And immediately I just like that kid for admitting that out loud. And this particular student went through and explained her cross country experience. And the cross country experience was that she and her friend freshman year wanted to go out for a sport and they'd never been particularly athletic, but they figured if they can't throw a ball and they can't catch one and they can't do any of those things, why don't we go out for cross country? And I love the line that she had in there when she said, three years later, my friend is long gone, parentheses, she lasted six weeks on the team, but here I am still plugging away. And this student told a really honest story about why she's enjoyed being on the cross country team and how as hard as she works, she knows like, I'm just not, she used the phrase, I'm just not built like a gazelle, like the rest of my teammates, but I love being on the team and I love finding my own ways to contribute. And so she talked about how she loves to cook. And so she hosted the pasta carbo load dinners before the, uh, you know, before each of the races and shared other examples like that. Now, when I share that with high school students, a lot of them you can tell are very shocked that a student might actually admit to not being good at something on a college application, you know, when they're expressing it on their college application. But as you well know, what makes a kid likable is not necessarily whether or not they're good at something, at least in a traditional way, like on a college admissions application. It's about the character and who this student is and what they like to interact with. And, what team would not want someone? I mean, now if I, I, I got the sense that with cross country, she wasn't inhibiting the chances for her team's success. The fastest runners were still out there, you know, running and winning races. So, given that, I think that any team would appreciate having somebody like that on the team that just loves being on the team and works as hard as everybody else and doesn't regret that she isn't winning the races. And in fact, she's finishing last in most of them. I believe that a college admissions officer would read that and say to themselves, this is a kid who won't quit freshman physics because it's too hard. This is somebody who's resilient. There's a certain energy there. Like there, there's something that, that that would be a positive contribution. So I would not necessarily tell that student to, you know, add a notation to the activity section on their application that says, you know, I was the worst runner on the cross country team. That's not the place to do that. That's where you're trying to impress them. But here, this is your story. And of course, the, the, the side, you know, strategy there is, you know, how many other students are actually going to be writing that story? Probably not that many. And it instantaneously makes that student likable. Now, it does not have to be a self-deprecating essay for it to do that. I mean, I've read incredibly warm, engaging essays that made me like kids where the entire story was about how they worked at Kentucky Fried Chicken throughout high school. I still remember that one where this student who went to an under-resourced school um, and I, I met this student at a program I was volunteering at over the summer, and we were talking about her high school activities, and she said, I don't really do any activities. And I said, really, you don't do anything? Like, after school, what do you do? And she said, oh, I, I just go to work. So, of course, my eyes light up. You go to work? Well, that's an activity. What do you do? Well, I work at Kentucky Fried Chicken, and she explained the whole story to me and how it's actually been something she's really enjoyed, and she started as soon as she was 16, but, and, and she's working 25 hours a week there after school and on the weekends. And why are you doing that? Well, it's because she's raised by a single mom and she contributes this money to her family. And all of a sudden this whole remarkable story opens up that this student previously didn't even think was worth sharing. And so what I got to tell her is you don't have to inject big life lessons into your time at Kentucky Fried Chicken. You can just tell the truth about what you've enjoyed about this. And why is this something that you continue to do? Because it sounds like it is out of necessity, but that's not all of it. You've gotten something back. Um, and she got to describe what she had gotten back. But her first sentence of the essay was, um, I'll never forget this. 
Once you see what the chicken, that Kentucky Fried Chicken looks like before it's cooked, you will never want to eat it. And then she went on to explain her experience there. She just said it's pretty unappetizing when you look at it before it gets cooked. I have to say, since she told me that, I don't believe I've actually been back to Kentucky Fried Chicken. It was never a staple in my diet, but that, 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 that line sticks in my mind. But, you know, I just smile when I talk about these kids. And I know that you do the same with those students that you remember so well or that you're working with right now. The best way for that student to share with a college what makes them so unique and what makes them special and what other people care about with them is just to tell a story from their own life that they actually care about. And whether that is playing soccer or doing art on their own or reading in their spare time or taking care of their baby sister because um, that both parents work and so they go home after school to do that or uh, the time they had to move to a new city three or three times while they were in high school, whatever the story is, we find that the best stories almost write themselves because it's the student just when they can just sit in front of you and tell it to you. Now, depending on your caseload size, you may not have that luxury of actually sitting down with that student to help them come up with a topic. In fact, frankly, most school counselors I've met just aren't able to do that. With It's not about dedication. It's about just hours in the day and number of students on your caseload. But this is another example where sharing this tip with students and giving them a few examples, whether you do that in a webinar, you know, if it's school wide or whether you do it in small group settings, they can take that advice and do something good with it. Because what they can think about is, well, I was thinking before I was definitely going to write about my involvement with National Charity League. But now I realize like I don't talk to people about National Charity League and I don't claim that it's changed me. I'm certainly happy that I did it, but it's not something that lights me up when I talk about it. Let me find something that does. And then when I do, just tell the truth. Now, of course, they've got to use this advice responsibly, right? I mean, I'm not saying that by telling the truth, you should reveal things that would make a college, you know, scared to bring you into their campus. This isn't a therapy session when you're writing it, but I've never really seen a student misuse this advice. And so this is really just trying to shift their thinking from share something that will impress them to share something that will help them get to know you better. And that really changes a student's perspective. And we have almost never found a senior that didn't have a story to tell. Now, some may, might be more inherently dramatic than others are, but I mean, this is why you're in education, right? It's why I am too. It's because these are interesting kids and they have stories worth telling um, that, that will help admissions officers appreciate this unique individual and their life. Uh, so I, I belabor this point a bit because all, the, the other three tips actually spring from this one. This is the one that a student has to get right. Um, and so refusing to try to impress and instead just being honest means that this student will share a real story from their life that when their best friend, their mother or their grandparent reads it, that person will say, this is totally you. I mean, I, I don't even need your name on this. I just know this is you. It sounds like you, the story is you, like this is, this is who you are. They can't capture everything about who they are. But the way to do that is share these slices of stories from your from your your life and share them in an honest way where you aren't so worried about how they'll they'll land in, ter in terms of the impression they make on the reader. It will land well if that student shares an honest story that gets that reader closer to understanding who they really are. Okay, let's move on to Cole. Any questions that have popped up yet that I should address? If so, just come on the camera. If not, I'm going to keep going. All right, I'm moving on. Okay, the second tip is called own your story. And this is, um, I think it's a phrase that we coined at CollegeWise and I generally need to explain it to students. As a concept, own your story means that each student has to share a story that no other student applying to college could write. And every time I say that sentence out loud in front of students, you see their eyes get wide because what they're thinking, understandably, is I don't have, I'm 17 years old. I don't have anything to talk about that hasn't happened to anybody else. I'm not that special. I'm not that unique. And that's true for most of them. I mean, there's a lot of students applying to college. It's very difficult to, to pick something that hasn't happened to anyone else. But the thing that changes this is details because one student's story about playing high school soccer is not the same as every other, and at least it's not inherently the same as every other student who played soccer. 
Or one student who wants to write about getting their black belts in karate might have had a very different experience doing that than someone else who also got a black belt. And you could say this about virtually any topic, whether it's immigrating to the United States, being raised by a single parent, uh, moving around a lot during high school, discovering your passion for playing music while you were in high school, quitting the football team and recommitting yourself to uh, being a, a leader in your church's youth group, whatever that thing is, if a student can explain it in a way that shows how their experience was unique to them, then it becomes something that can be a very powerful story, even if the topic itself might be one that many other students are writing about. So I mentioned the example in the beginning of, you know, students make the mistake of trying to guess like what's going to be impressive. And then they land on something that's pick something I'm proud of and inject lessons into it. Well, that's the formula that, right, that, that leads to all the cliched essays, but it's not the topics themselves. The fact that the student is saying something about playing a sport that so many other students are saying is what makes that topic cliche. It's not that sports is a cliche topic. So here's a little litmus test that students can use to help them gauge whether or not this is a story that they own. And this is what we teach to our college-wise students. And I shared this with any student who comes to any of our open public uh, college essay seminars or webinars. Own your story means ask yourself, could someone else tell the same story? As this student is considering the topic and what they want to say about it, they can ask themselves, out of the over 1 million students who are applying to college this year, could any one of these other students have this same experience? If the answer, excuse me, let me move on here. I got to get my slide to move. If the answer is yes, then they're on to something. If the answer is no, excuse me, uh, and sorry, I'm noticing this is one and one here. I think it reset itself when we uploaded them. If the answer is yes, usually the reason the student can, can own this story is because they're able to inject enough detail into the story, all right? So they can ask themselves, could someone else tell this story? And if they're not sure whether or not that, that that's uh, something they could rely on, they can say, well, what if I injected details into this? What if I talked about not just the fact that my mother, uh, my, that my family and I immigrated to the United States, but what if I shared the detail of the conversation my parents had with me on my first day of second grade in this new country and like what that's meant for me going through my life? Well, now that is something that they own because only your parents said those words to you in that moment on that day before you entered into your second grade class. That's what details do for them. But here is the, the really powerful part about this. If a student considers, could someone else share this story? And they're, uh, uh, and they're unsure about it, so they inject more detail to make it their own, then it's theirs. But if they can't find detail to inject and to take ownership of this story, the smartest and most powerful thing that student could do is to choose a different story. And really reinforce for them, it does not invalidate that experience that you're talking about. And remember how I said the tips tied together? Sometimes a student comes in and they're, they're predisposed to write about one topic because they've spent a lot of time with it and they're really proud of it and they should be. We don't want to take that away from them. But now we're asking, is this something that's appropriate to talk about in your college essay, given the goals of the college essay? Or is this something that would be better left just listed proudly on the application? And we want students to get into this sort of thinking because once a student gets emotionally invested in a topic, many of them have a hard time sort of weaning themselves off of that. But a student who has this rubric will say to themselves, I've actually heard students say things akin to, uh, you know, I was planning on writing about insert activity here, right? Whatever it is about like, you know, being junior class president. But honestly, like, the only thing I would do is just describe what I did as junior class president. And, you know, I planned a dance and I held the, I chaired the meetings and I helped publicize things that we were doing and it was great. And I'm glad I did it. But I mean, I don't really have anything to say about it that would be different from any other student's experience who've done, who's done this. So I'm just going to write about something else. And the fact that they get there on their own without a knowledgeable school counselor or someone else who knows what they're doing intervening and saying, you might want to be careful about going this way. They get there on their own and they don't feel bad about leaving that topic behind. That's a wonderful outcome. So again, the, the process we want to use here is explain what own your story means, which is you have to write essays that no other student applying to college is going to write. And the way that you do that is to inject enough detail into your story so that whether it's about 
taking martial arts or reading, you know, for pleasure or pursuing a topic you're interested in by learning about it on YouTube or whatever it is, you inject enough detail so that it becomes your story. Someone else can write about the same topic, but they don't have my details. And then the most powerful thing is if they can't find enough detail to inject, choose a different story. And when they do that, they're really taking control of this process for themselves. Okay, forging ahead here. But you know what actually I'd like to do before I forge ahead? I wanna share an example with you of someone who owned their story. Uh, I've used sports a couple of times. I'm gonna stick with sports here just because it's applicable, but there's no admissions preference or preference on my part for sports stories. I, I, love, I love lots of different ones, but we had a student one time who was a, um, a, a really, really high performing basketball player in high school and was getting actively recruited by many division one colleges. And he was also a straight A student. So he was a pretty appealing prospect. And he came to this webinar that we talked about. And when he came in to do his essay brainstorming with us, he said, you know, I was thinking about writing about basketball ahead of time because that's kind of absorbed all my time in high school. But now I'm thinking, I'm not really sure what I'd say about it. And so our, you know, what I'd say about it that would own it. And so after probing a little bit, um, what our counselor learned is that this student had two younger brothers who also played basketball and a father who had played college basketball. And so they were sort of a basketball family. And as we started to ask him more questions about this, he shared all these wonderful stories about, uh, and he said, you know, well, we have all these different games that we play with basketball at home. I said, like, you know, what, what kind of games? What do you mean? He said, well, there are some mornings when my dad will come into our room and my brothers sleep in the bunk bed. And, you know, I'm over on the other side of the room. We all share a room together. My dad will come in and say on like a Saturday morning, last one on the court has a job to do. And if you were the last one out on the basketball court, you had to pick up all the apples that had fallen from our apple tree. So we would race out of our beds and put our high tops on and get off and untied and just get out there as fast as we could. Here I'm taking ownership of the story here, by the way. We're in the room in the bunk bed and we race to put on our high tops. And if you're the last one out there, you got to pick up the apples that had fallen from our tree. Someone else can have a basketball story about their family, but this one is mine. That's owning the story. Uh, he talked about how they would play a game called King for a Day, where uh, the youngest brother and the, the uh, dad would play against the, our kid, who was the, you know, the, the oldest brother and, uh, and, and the middle one. And whichever team won got to order the other team around for the rest of the day. He talked about how they would play two on two against each other with the dad and the brothers and how growing up, whoever was on dad's team always won because dad was so much bigger and stronger than the boys. But then as this kid Lenny put it, he said, but by the time I was a sophomore in high school, I was 6'5". And that's when my dad started to lose his stronghold on the basketball court. And he started laughing as he was describing it. He said, that's when my dad started to cheat. And we said, well, what, what do you mean he started to cheat? He said, oh, he would foul us. He would change the score. And he's beaming while he's talking about this. And he finished this essay by saying, this, um, this year is going to culminate in a very special, special experience for us because for the first time in our lives, my brothers and I are going to be starters on a basketball team together, on my high school varsity team. And I know there's going to come a time this season when our coach calls a timeout and we're going to glance up in the stands and we're going to see my dad sitting in the same seat where he sits for every game. And we're going to know that all those hours we spent out on that court playing, having fun and beating each other up have all been worth it. And the title of his essay he came up with was Home Court Advantage. And what I loved about that is, I mean, his application screamed basketball. I mean, I, I mean, he was a great student, but like everything he had done revolved around basketball. He was one of those, well, new age athletes, like so many of you have, where they're not playing three different sports. They're picking one and doing it all year round, especially if they really want to play in college. Um, and I, it just gave such insight into things that that school could never have learned about from his application, like how close he is with his family. And like what a sensitive kid he is and how much this is meant to him to have those opportunities. You got to know a side of that student that you never would have known. So this is a way of saying there are no overused topics. There are only overused approaches. And so a story about high school football is difficult. We do two a days during the summer and then we have to go to practices every day and we have to do weight training. That's not a story that a football player owns and you could make the same mistake with basketball. But this kid said, I wanna talk about basketball. I'm just gonna do the version that only I can tell. And again, we found that students can, can take these tips 
and they can actually work with them on their own. So if you ask our counselors, all of whom were admissions, or not all, but many of whom were admissions officers, and you ask them to talk about their favorite essays that they've read, there's no overlap between the kinds of topics. They all have different examples that they remember, but there is overlap with these tips. Every example they share is a kid who just told the truth and a kid who owned their story and wrote about something that was either a unique topic by itself or they just put in so much detail that this became their unique essay. Um, Arun, who I mentioned, has told us over and over again, he said, I can read three essays in a row about the same topic, like doing volunteer work, and have them be pretty standard and very similar to all the other ones to the point that I don't want to read about the one time you volunteered on a blood drive. I've, I've read enough of these. But then a fourth kid can come through writing about the same topic, and it could be completely refreshing because they just own the story. So it's not, you know, admissions officers really aren't inherently in, in favor or opposed to any particular topics. Their goal is, I want to understand this 17-year-old human being that's applying to my college. Um, which, by the way, I don't know how many of you end up hearing from, uh, from parents who are, are trying to inject themselves into the college essays with their kids. But our advice to parents, and we get to be very blunt with them, we have that luxury in our job. Um, our advice to them is don't get involved with the essays. I don't care if, you, if you're a writer. I don't care if you, know, you, you, you feel that this is something that, that you have an expertise around. This is your child. None of us are impartial about our own kids. Um, pitting parents and students to, you know, against each other during the college essay process where mom or dad is giving them feedback about their essay is just a recipe for disaster in many cases. And more importantly, in fact, this is really the, the key here, admissions officers aren't interested in the parent's perspective. They want to know the 17-year-old's perspective. Um, they're not trying to admit the adult. They're trying to admit the teenager. And teenagers see the world differently than kids do. Um, I remember working with a student named Jeff, whose mother had grown up in Spain. And uh, his mother ignored our advice and came to his brainstorming meeting. But she was great. She said, I'm not going to stay. I know you said this is his process. I just wanted to share a story that I think would be really good for him. And we said, great, well, we're, we're open to that. Like, Jeff, are you open to that? Great, let's hear the story. And she said, well, I was raised in Spain. My husband was raised here. And two summers ago, uh, Jeff had the opportunity to go spend the summer with my extended family in Spain. And she turned to him and she said, Jeff, I thought that was a really formative experience for you. I thought it really gave you a connection to your culture that you didn't have before. And she was going through her reasons, all of which are valid for her. But Jeff was making that face that teenagers, especially boys, make sometimes that when their mother is talking, kind of like this. And when she finished her description, Jeff said, Mom, I wasn't thinking any of those things while I was in Spain. Now, to be fair, when Jeff is in college and he's 21 or when he gets older and he's 31, chances are he's going to look back and say, you know, I was too young to appreciate it at the time, but that was actually a really great thing I got to do. Go see where my mom grew up go meet her family. I, I'm really glad I, I, I took advantage of that. But 17-year-old Jeff doesn't see that yet. And that's okay. Because if he wrote that essay, well, he's violating rule one. He's just trying to impress them by following his mother's directions. And a, a, a tale of caution here that I'm sure you've shared with your students, but please continue to do it. If you are, admissions officers can tell. They can tell when a parent or just, not even just a parent, any uh, inevitably well-meaning person, but just got too involved and just gave the kid their own suggestions and you should say this, it, it stops sounding like the student and admissions officers can smell that much the same way that with your own students, you know when they're up to something, you know when they're not telling you the truth. We do that with our own kids too and our own families. Right? Admissions officers read enough of these things, they can tell. So that was my side note of advice there about parents to try to keep them away from essays. We won't fight with them if they insist on being involved, but we can tell them, you know, you're going to make it harder on your kid because it's going to be evident that they had too much help. I don't think that parents shouldn't say anything, but I think they have to let their students drive this process. But in terms of own your story, that is an example of where this student that I just talked about, about Leo, the basketball player, he got to describe it the way it really meant something to him. And the, the reason it meant something to him was because of these fun games they would play together. But the adults reading this story see that's a student who can appreciate family and close connections. And he sounds like he's got a level of sincerity. And we can see that being a really valuable addition to a dorm room and a classroom in college. Okay, let's move on to tip three. 
Okay, we'll move on to my own your story. Now we go to tip three. Now you can see these, these tips start to sort of intertwine just a bit. Don't repeat information from the rest of your application. The reason this is a frequent mistake in college applications is because of students avoiding or, or ignoring rule one or just not knowing it. Again, when they ask themselves what's going to sound impressive, they often race to an activity or accomplishment that makes them proud. And frequently, that activity or accomplishment that makes them proud has already been explained on the application. And so what students need to ask themselves is, listen, I want to use each part of my application to help colleges better understand me. So on the application where I list my activities, that's a great spot to show what I've cared about and how much time I've dedicated to it. But is that necessarily something that I should then take and repeat the, 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 that, that story over here? Well, that depends. And here's the litmus test they can use. The one way that you can write a story that's not repeating information is the obvious way. It is pick a story that is not mentioned anywhere on your application. So um, you could say that the student who wrote about playing basketball with his family did it this way. Now it was a it was a version of something that was mentioned, but this you know this is not shared anywhere. Uh, you can't say on your list of activities I play basketball games informally with my brothers and my dad on the weekends, and we have to pick up you know trees from our apple if we're not out in time. There's not enough detail to describe that. So one way is say just talk about something that has nothing to do with your college application, and that might be the example of babysitting my sister. Right? Um, you don't get paid for that, but I have a baby sister and I go home after school and I take care of her until my parents get home. And I want to tell you what that's been like and all the imaginative games I've come up with to try to keep a five-year-old engaged with you know, their teenage older sister. The other way a student can do this, here's my reset numbering again, that should be one, two, but what do we just forge ahead, right? This is what we do as, as people who work with teenagers. It's unpredictable, our work. You have to be adaptable, don't we? share new information about something that is listed on the application. So think about the example of the slow cross-country runner. They knew that she was a cross-country runner. They knew that she had done this and that she, her senior year, this is now her fourth year. They knew roughly how many hours a week and how many months a year she was spending because she has said that on the application already. What they don't know is that she was the slowest runner on the team and loved it anyway. And so she focused on that part. But either one of those approaches can lead to a successful following of this rule. But again, I think students sometimes just want to make sure that colleges notice that thing I've listed over there. I just want to make sure it's prominent in my application. And sometimes listing it in an activity section or in an honors or rewards section is enough. So it doesn't, it doesn't discount the impressiveness of what you did to then not write an essay about it. Just make sure of when you're writing an essay about it, that you're not just repeating something this, this college already knows. Um, in fact, I've made reference to this already, but sometimes students actually end up doing that because they're not following these other rules. Like, um, you know, someone who says uh, that I, I participated in, in volunteer work because I think it's important to help other people. That's a wonderful sentiment, but it's not unique. And so if a student says, well, they already know that I did all that volunteer work. And I'm gonna list that proudly on my application because I deserve to be recognized for that. It took me a lot of time and I cared about it. But whether or not I write an essay about it depends on, do I have a story that I can own? Is this something I want to talk about? It's not that they're not gonna notice it if I don't write an essay. I just need to know, do I have new information to share about this topic? And if I don't, then that's fine. I'm comfortable leaving it where it is on the application and I'll write about something else here. So again, and I'm trying to hammer this home, but in each of these cases with these tips, we're trying to give a student of any academic level of any writing ability to actually run through these questions in their head and help them arrive at their own better conclusions. It doesn't necessarily mean that I wouldn't encourage that student to then seek out help from somebody they trust, whether that's an English teacher, whether that's you as their school counselor, or whoever's made available to them. Feedback is good for college essays, especially when it comes from people who know the student well and even better when they understand the role of college essays, which is, it has to be you know, a teacher, a, a school counselor, an admissions professional. Uh, the truth is, and I'm sure you run up against this all the time, but there are a lot of well-meaning family members and friends that, yeah, of, of students that are convinced they know what the student should be writing about and oftentimes it's just not it's just not a great choice but um, again if they follow this they'll avoid this fate so 
we have we have our three tips we've covered. Don't try to impress the admissions officers. Just be honest, own your story, and don't repeat inf information from the rest of your application. Now, these are all the previous three tips have all been about topic selection, and and once you once you select that topic, what is a good way to express it? But we haven't talked at all about the like the actual mechanics of the writing. And, and what should a student endeavor to do when they're writing this essay? And our tip that we use here is sound like you. And when I say that, I say, you know, you have a story that you might wanna tell to a friend. If you were then going to tell that same story to your high school principal, would you share it the same way? Would you share all the same details? Would you describe it the same way? If you were gonna share it with your parent, would you share it the same way as you did with your principal or your best friend? And what that helps students recognize is we, we all have different voices that we use. You don't even need to tie that example to college essays, by the way. You could say, do you guys speak to your parents the same way you speak to your best friend? Do you speak to your best friend the same way you would speak to your high school principal or your boss at work or your coach on the team or the supervisor where you volunteer or the instructor who's teaching you how to paint? Do you, do you speak to all those people exactly the same way? And most students will say, well, no, not exactly the same way. That's because we all have different voices. So we have to help them find the appropriate voice for college essays. And most students will default to an academic voice like they have been taught to use in their English classes. And the English teachers, and again, I was raised by one of them, they are teaching students the right things because when these students go to college, and they're expected to write academic papers, that is exactly the voice they should be using. And it's exactly the structure they should be using. There should be an introduction, there should be a thesis, there should be topic paragraphs, there should be a conclusion. And that structure can work well with college essays too, and often does, but here's the key. This is not an academic essay. This is a personal essay. You're not being graded on how well you make your argument. You're being evaluated based on how well do we get to know you in this story. This is the one, for most of these students, this is the one time in their life they're having so far where they're having to write an essay with that goal in mind. And many of them don't even know that that's the goal in mind. So they know it once we've gone through these tips. Now we wanna get them to express, you know, they've used these first three, story, first three tips to pick appropriate stories. Now we want to unleash them to actually tell those stories in effective ways. And so when we say sound like you, here's what we ask students to consider. First, would you say these words to someone else? This sentence that you are writing right now in your college essay, is that something you would say to someone else? And if they ask you, well, who? Well, to anyone, would you ever say that out loud? And that'll prevent them from saying thing or writing things like, um, well, like, you know, volunteering for a Saturday at a homeless shelter taught me the importance of helping other people. Let's just strip out whether or not that's a nice sentiment or whether or not it's impressive. Is that a, a statement you would make to someone else? And most of the time when I've tested a teenager with that, they'll say, well, I don't know that I'd say it like that. I don't think that I'd actually express it that way. I'll, I might just say that it felt really good to do. Great. Well, then say that. Like, don't say the other version where, because you're actually violating rule one, you're trying to sound impressive, right? Um, so ask themselves, would you say these words to someone else? And if not, rephrase it. Um, that will keep them from being too formal. We don't want it to sound like an academic essay. They're not writing a PhD thesis here, right? I mean, they're writing a personal essay about themselves. But we also do not want them to be too informal. So the second question we ask is, how would you describe this to your favorite teacher? Because we presume that if a student has a favorite teacher, and you could even insert yourself here and say your favorite teacher or your school counselor, if you've gotten to know them, we assume that that's an adult that a student respects, but also feels comfortable with. And that is the voice they should be using when they're writing their college essays. Um, some of you might know this because you might have met them during school visits, but in our experience, and this has been backed up by the, the, uh, the former admissions officers who work with us, 
The average age of a college admissions officer is usually early to mid 20s. It's sort of a fun job that they take right after college with the promise of you'll get to travel around and oftentimes you're doing it with your alma mater. And so, you know, a 24 year old might sound like a dinosaur to a teenager, but you and I both know that 24 year old is pretty young. They're closer in age to this student than they are to most of the parents. So, you know, people have this, uh, kids especially have this sort of vision of, you know, college admissions officers sometimes, you know, being old, wise, sort of formal people. And in fact, you're writing to people that are close in age to you and they were in high school not all that long ago. And so it is appropriate for students to take a more informal tone. We just don't want them to become too informal. So imagine what a student would do if you have, were able to share these tips with them and get them to really understand how to apply them. Well, they would avoid the most common mistake that students of all backgrounds and all levels of achievement make, which is they wouldn't worry too much whether or not something was impressive. That's a great start. And they just tell their version that's actually the truth. I mean, that alone gets them way out ahead of the rest of the competition. Then as they start to consider what they might want to talk about, they ask themselves, do I own this story? And is this something I could tell in a way that no one else would be able to tell? And they'll search for details to inject into that story, which will make a good story even better, or it will highlight that this is not an appropriate topic for a college essay and the student will get there on their own when they do that. They will consider whether or not this has been something that has been accurately explained and sufficiently explained on the application already. And if it has, they'll leave it there and talk about something else, or they'll find new information to share about this thing that's already shared there. That is, I don't wanna say that it's foolproof, but I have never seen a student earnestly embrace those three tips and then somehow arrive at a cliched or ineffective conclusion. I, they will come up with a story that has value and that is personal and that they're actually engaged in telling. And then all we've got to get them to do at the end is sound like you and just ask yourself as you're telling it. You can even just think to yourself, if you were to go in after school and say to your favorite teacher, like, you know, hey, Mrs. Suarez, I just wanted to tell you about something that, uh, you know, that happened to me over the weekend. How would you do that? How would you describe it to them? That's the tone that you should use here. So we get them to avoid the overused mistake or the, you know, the, the so common mistake of being trying to sound impressive. We get them to inject details and own a story. We get them to avoid repeating information that's already there. We get them to express it in a way where if someone knew this student well, they would read that and say, oh, this even sounds like you. So now we've got a topic that is you, an expression that sounds just like um, you know, the, the person who uniquely knows you, and we've got your tone, your voice in saying it that sounds like you. Now we have an admissions officer getting much closer to knowing the real you, even though you're not meeting face to face. And that to us gives students the best chance of standing out. So my encouragement here for you in whatever way you think makes the most sense for you and your students in your school community, try to get these tips in students' hands and give them some examples about, and you can choose them if you feel like some are more appropriate than others, but give them some license and some encouragement to actually use these and remind them that you didn't just come up with this, we didn't just come up with this because it seemed like a good idea. This is something that we built based on actual college admissions officers telling us over and over again, these are the mistakes that I wish if I could just get in front of students and tell them what to do, this is what I would tell them. Well, we listened to all of them and we distilled all of that advice into these four tips. So students don't need to go out and, and seek out or pay necessarily for that kind of insight. They can get, at least around essays, they can get that just by using these tips and then any additional help that they can avail themselves of, whether that's with you or with the teacher, they can then do. So I really appreciate um, your attention, especially you know, on a webinar like this, where I know it's inherently not as engaging as going face to face. I'm gonna turn it back over now to N Nicole and Darcy to wrap us up and I can take any questions you guys have. Thanks, Kevin. It's always so fun to see you present the essay and all the stories and everything. Um, <laughs> For those of you, Kevin, we have a few minutes here at the end. So if you have any questions, feel free to drop those in the Q&A. Um, I think the question that I'll ask you, Kevin, while we wait for a couple of those coming in is, um, when, what should a counselor do when uh, you know, a student brings in a story, they've been working on it, they've been really proud of it, and you can just tell that it's not necessarily their best work? How would you approach that situation with a student? 
that is always difficult. I mean, that's what drove us, as I said, to, to build this, this seminar. Um, I would start out, but anytime a student says, hey, would you give me feedback on this essay? I would start out by clarifying what they mean when they say feedback. Because sometimes what a student is expressing is, I wrote something I'm really proud of. I worked really hard on it. And I'm asking you for feedback, but what I'm really asking is for you to join me in this excitement, right? I wanna know my counselor believes in me. That's a very different ask than, I want this essay to be as good as it can possibly be. Can you please give me direct feedback? Now you can ask that in different ways. You can say like, so before I give you feedback, can I ask you, how are you feeling about this? Scale of one to 10, 10 is it's the best thing you've ever done. Like one is it's terrible and you hate it. Where are you on that scale? That can help you evaluate how to approach this. And then you can even just say, before I even look at this thing, I don't even know what you wrote about. How honest do you want me to be? If I think it's great, I'm sure you want me to tell you it's great. If I think it's not the right choice for you, do you want me to be honest with you? Usually a student will say, I really want you to be honest, but sometimes they'll have given you the heads up that, oh, I worked really hard on this and I got help from my English teacher and I think it's really good. And then you can approach it differently. That, that's how I would do it. It's not foolproof, but it tends to work well and it opens up a dialogue between you and the student. Well, I, I, what I think that that's absolutely the case. All of us, I think, face students that come in and we want to support them. And that's, that's why our jobs are here. Um, I know, so it sounds like we got a little bit of a quiet crowd. I have one last question for you and then we'll kind of talk about what's next. Do these, you know, tips and everything, do they also apply to the supplemental essays that we know a lot of schools are starting to ask uh, applicants to do, especially yeah. in test optional world? Any piece of writing that is part of the college application process, a common app essay, a specific school essay about uh, tell us more about how you came to be interested in Boston University, um, a scholarship essay they're writing. Um, I wouldn't advise them to use these when they're writing academic essays in their English classes, but that's the very different essays we talked about. So any part, any writing that's part of an application, I would encourage students to use these four tips. I've never ever seen a student embrace these and watch it lead them astray when it comes to college admissions. Awesome. Well, thanks, Kevin. Thank you all so much for joining us. I want to make sure you can get back to your school communities. Again, please hop back on Zello. Uh, we are going to be doing our last webinar of the professional development series featuring yours truly talking about everything Common App and how students can really utilize that uh, to help their uh, chances of success. That's going to be on Wednesday, uh, October 6th at 3 p.m. Eastern. So hopefully we'll see you all. Again, if you had to step out, the recording will be sent to you later this week, along with some fun resources. We have a really great uh, one pager that has all of Kevin's tips and everything. So you can send to your students, post outside your door, uh, et cetera. But hopefully everyone's out there staying safe and doing well. And we're so grateful you joined us today.